Welcome back. It's still Breakfast Daily on City TV. Thank you so much for staying with us. Now, our personality today is a woman that you want to learn from. She's been in Ghana's film industry for as long as I can remember, probably before I was born, if I'm not exaggerating. She's not that old. I'm talking about Juliet Ya Asantoa Asante. She is the CEO of the National Films Authority, board chair of NAFTI, and the founder of the Black Star International Film Festival. She's also a humanitarian. She's an entrepreneur. She wears a lot of hats, okay? So throughout our conversation with her, if you have any questions, please let us know with the hashtag Breakfast Daily. And our WhatsApp line is 550 585832. If you're watching outside Ghana, you can use the country code plus 233, and you can tweet at me at Jifa City TV. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. You are looking great. I you must are say. looking beautiful too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now you wear so many hats. Sure. Yes, I try. I mean, what what's your average day like? Ha, huh. my average day depends actually, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot happens in my head. So my average day is lying on the bed in the morning. First thing when I wake up these days, I try and say thank you, meditate a little bit if I can, and then try and plan in my head. And, uh, you know, basically then the things, you know, the craziness starts. If I have time, I spend like 30 minutes in my garden. It's something I love. Um, and then the craziness starts, basically. But, you know, when the craziness is happening, I can't create a lot. So once in a while, I like to take time off and, and then create in my head. It's crazy. Now, National Films Authority, tell mm -hmm. us a bit about it and your, your role there. Right. Um, so the National Film Authority uh, is a government agency. We are under the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture. And our mandate pretty much oversees everything film. Uh, we haven't had that necessarily as a country. In other countries, it's called a film commission or, you know, all of that. And basically what that does, uh, you know, is regulation, policy, marketing, directing, originating content, uh, developing content. I mean, if you look at the mandate of the National Film Authority, it's really, really broad. Um, supervision, direction, everything. Um, we are quite new. We are barely 15 months old. I've been in the position for just about that time. Uh, and as soon as I got into the position, our first goal was to strategize. Where do we want to go? We are a new agency. You know, when you're forming a government agency, I've started so many companies in my private life. So I had that experience. But starting a government agency and navigating a government agency is a whole new era. And so I had to learn. Uh, of course, I did uh, public policy and public administration as my master's. But it was quite, you know, all the things you have to go through, all the permissions you have to get, all the registrations. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't just get up and say, this is what I want to do. It has to go through processes. And then, of course, there's our parent ministry. Um, so it's, it, for me, it's been a learning process. Um, my stakeholders are very diverse <laughs> and, um, you know, very knowledgeable and, and, and very scattered and very creative and uh, also can contribute a lot, um, have a lot of opinions, diverse opinions. So all around, it's been quite the roller coaster. We'll come back to all the mm. awesome things that you've been doing there. Thank but, you. Uh, let's talk about your early days. Right. Where did you grow up? How was life like as a child? Hmm. How was life as a child? I don't go there often. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I was born, you know, I'm a Ghanaian, so I was born in Ghana, uh, Ghana Mampong. Okay. And then, but very quickly, my grandmother was a policewoman, one of the first police women in Ghana, okay. uh, who left the police service and migrated to Liberia. Um, as, as a trader, you know, as a businesswoman. So just right after I was born, my parents kind of followed her and we went to Liberia um, and, and we had a family there. You know, we adopted, you know, should I say a family adopted us there. And it was quite an intriguing growing up years, you know. Um, I loved it. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful country before the war. Unfortunately, the war destroyed it. We all know that. Um, somewhere along the line, I was very sick, uh, so that crowds my, my right. thinking a little bit. Uh, for about two years, I couldn't walk. I was crippled. And after that, 
Um, not long after that, you know, the war kind of started. You know, it didn't really start, but there was like uh, some unrest. And you know those days, they always said that uh, Ghana had the best education. Mm -hmm. uh, and so at some point, my parents were like, you know, let's take the kids back. Um, whilst we continue to stay here, hustle. My mother, late mother, uh, such a hard-working woman, the hardest working woman I've ever met. Um, so we came to Ghana, and, and my mom and my dad stayed over. By then, my grandmother had passed. Um, and unfortunately, the war met them there. Hmm. So it was quite traumatic. Um, and then later, they joined us. I remember that year, the war started. I was actually supposed to go on vacation. And then, you know, they say how things happen, and you should just accept things. Yeah. You know, my passport is like... There were so many issues around my passport, and then I couldn't go. And then just less than three months, the war started. How old were you? When the war started? Yeah. I don't even remember. But I came, we came back in 87. I think it started um, early 90s. or I don't remember, really. So at that mm. young age, I'm assuming the, the, the three people right. you knew, mm. your mom, your dad, your mm. mama, mm. They were all not in Ghana with you. How was that transition like before they moved back to join? It was tough. My grandmother passed before yeah. we came. Um, it was tough because we had to live with family and myself and my siblings, we had to be separated because, you know, you go here, you go here, you go here. Um, and I was, I think, the most troublesome of them all. <laughs> so I'll go here, cause trouble, and then I'll be passed on to the other, and I'll go cause trouble, and I'll be passed on to the other. Where were you causing trouble? I was just, I was just, you know, when you're, um, I was a very creative young child, and nobody understood me necessarily. And, you know, I, I was a bit of a tomboy as well and all that. And, um, and I'd seen a lot as a young girl, you know, like I said, I was sick and I'd been taken from yeah. one place to the other, yeah. one village, one medicine man, because the hospital couldn't cure me. Wow. So finally, it was actually a traditional healer, mm -hmm. uh, herbal healer, Ghanaian, living in Liberia, who cured me. So... Um, in some of those experiences, I'd been more treated and all of that. So it was, you know, it, it, it all those things you. toughens you, you know. And I, I kind of had my very own mind. I knew what I wanted to do. And, you know, when you are in a society, sometimes people expect you to conform. And I'm not a conformist. <laughs> so as now as adults, mm -hmm. looking at children who mm. may have the same qualities you had, right. how do we embrace that child for knowing who she is, for being fearless mm. without necessarily beating it out of her? It's an interesting question you ask, and I'll tell you why. Just last weekend, I went to a little, I'll have this uh, waterfall at a breed that I go to. And on my way... You have to take me one day. Oh, you would <laughs> love it. I mean, it's such a beautiful space to be in. It just relaxes me. Mm -hmm. And as I was going, there were these kids incredible three kids they were like ma are you going to the waterfall i was like yeah well come along with it and so they jumped behind my car and then they were, were going and they were so excited then i think one of them their father i understand you know uh, the the response but he was like where are you going I was like oh we're going to the whatever and then and this child had when when we were going the child had such a look on his face he was like this was his day you know and i was like if i get there i will talk to these children and then he just pulled out the cane and started to beat the child. Coffee, you know, that kind of thing. Like, you know, and the, the child, two went with me. But one, of course, I don't think it was fear that I was somebody yeah. trying to steal the children or anything. But just beating the child, this child had a lot of, you know, uh, was looking forward to what was going to happen. I, you know, just seeing the child's shoulders drop return, walk away. I love cartoons, so I would use that cartoon thing, you know, and I, in my mind, I was just, it just took me back, you know, kind of a metaphor. I was like, you know, this is how we beat the creativity out of our kids. We don't allow our children to express themselves. I remember as a young child, I've been passionate about hair, the, the, the woman, the, the hair of the girl. Um, Liberia, they don't cut hair. So when I came, I had all my beautiful long hair, First day in school, scissors, and, and that just put me down. My hair never came back <laughs> as it, it used to. Um, it, just, it was just the beginning of a life of putting down. Is 
Yeah, we you say yeah, when you say yeah, you never amount to anything. Yeah, da 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 da. Yeah, da 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 da. And you know, I had to fight that. So when you talk about, uh, you know, taking the creativity out of children, beating the hell out of children, not appreciating children, I love to have conversations with children. They are incredible. Recently, we at the National Film Authority, for instance, we did a we're doing something and, and for me young people they're incredible if you listen to them and i put a young person we put a young person on one of the committees and the reaction you know was incredible what has this child got to contribute what's in this child's head and i'm thinking this is the future and you're sitting there saying what is in this child's head so that kind of um mentality i think impacts us greatly and if you compare children from this side of the world to children from other parts of the world, you understand how the impact is a lot. So for, from where you sit now mm -hmm. as the CEO of the National Film Authority mm -hmm. and seeing the potential mm -hmm. that we could take advantage of, how important is it for us to start from when the, they are children? Mm. If the child wants to act and be in a play, mm. let them play. If they want mm. to write, let them write so that 10, 15 years from now, the nation can actually, you know, really benefit from mm -hmm. the skills that they are honing from that age. It's critical. Um, our future depends on it, especially if you look at the fact that in less than 10 years, 40% of the world's youth will be from Africa. Uh, and I think by now, if you look at even in Ghana, if you take every 10 people, about seven to eight or so will be below the age of 30. And so when we are making decisions and the, the young people are not at the table, we are doing them a lot of disservice. We are doing ourselves a disservice. I learn a lot from my, my, my children. I mean, they are the reason why I stay, you know, I led to what's going on. And I was very happy when um, I worked with the now uh, Minister of Education as the head of curriculum for the Creative Arts School um, coming up in, in Kumase, and, and you know, he's very visionary in that sense. We spoke about the hidden curriculum and, and how the things you feed the kids, not, not consciously in the curriculum, but you know, things like who we are, where we are from, where we are going, giving kids the opportunity to dream and visualize, and everything is about what is in the brain. Everything is about what you can see. I always say that Everything I built, I saw it before I built it. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't create spaces where, you know, whilst I was working on the curriculum, there's this thing, and I hope the school keeps it, called maker space. That is a phenomenon globally where you just put the kids in the space and you give them things which they can destroy or whatever, <laughs> but they try and fix things and put things together. And by the time they are done, inventions happen. I mentored at MIT and, um, you know, I, I, I was a mentor at MIT and the incredible things that people are doing around the world. And when you come to this part of the world, we are not even conscious of how we can give our children spaces to create. So I think that as a country, if there's one thing we can focus on. It's just allowing our kids to grow and create and be free. And I think that uh, we are a bit afraid of our, ourselves, and that's why we are afraid of letting our kids to expand. And if we do that, it will be helpful to us as a society. At that young age, you mm. said that you, you knew what you wanted and you knew how to get it. Mm. For the teenagers, adults watching us who don't know how to do that, you know, because society has a way of beating us down so much that even when those people are no longer around you, right. you start doing it to yourself right. on their behalf. Right. How are you able to still go after your dreams? I was lucky to have parents, you know, my, I always say my, my dad never beat me. You know, I never remember my dad ever beating me. My mom once in a while, I think spanked my, my buttocks when I was very young, but that's all I remember. Um, and so my parents, but we all turned out <laughs> pretty great, so you know. It spare the and no, spare the child. I, well, there are various <laughs> ways that you, I never beat my children. Of course, there was a time when, you know that thing where they let you hold your ear and go and down? It's even more painful than caning, <laughs> you know? And um, that, I use that once in a while. Um, I saw it somewhere that it's a form of exercise. <laughs> it, actually, you know... I saw it online somewhere. Ah, 
<laughs> my kid, one of my kids was telling me uh, the last time that mommy, you know, when anytime you made me do that, I, afterwards I'll be like, yeah, but then I'll suffer for one week. <laughs> no cane can, can extend can to that. one week. So, you know, that's great uh, to keep, uh, that's great to keep people in check. Mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like, you know, it's important that we allow uh, young people the space to, to, you know, express themselves and to envisage and dream and just allow, you know, we want transformation. Yeah. And the only way we can have transformation is to focus on the young people coming. You know, we have, we can only pave the way now. And for me, in my position, that's why what I'm doing, I'm so passionate about because I give young people, uh, younger people than me, who I know will feed back into even younger people, um, the space to dream and create stories and, um, you know, our, our folklores and our heroes, all of those things haven't been done. Mm -hmm. And I think the space to, to tell our stories to the world is rampant. And if we allow young people to get into that space, it will help us as a country. At what point did you know that the movie industry will be the path you will take? Very early. First, I wanted to sing. <laughs> But I can't sing to save my life. You know, I used to tell my friends that if I want to punish you, I'll just tie your hands and, and sing. sing to you. And then that will be my punishment to you. So, um, yeah, um, I wanted to you sing. it right now. Where was, where, when was this? <laughs> this was, um, I think, Cape Coast University. It was miming. You know, I got on stage uh. and I performed so well that... People thought I was actually singing, oh, nice. and, and 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 you know, someone reached out to me and said, "I'll be your manager." I'm like, "Look, I can't sing I can't to save sing. my life." But, at least but you were confident. But you know, I you was confident. I was dressed for it. So I love to sing. Um, I wanted to be like Whitney Houston. Uh, she was my idol. Um, uh, you know, but then uh, when we came to Ghana, very quickly in school, I got into the drama. You know, I went to Enum Secondary School, then I went to Okwapamai Secondary School. Both schools, I was in the drama. So I started on stage. Um, and when I went to my parents, I wanted to be a lawyer first. Okay. Um, but because of the war, my parents were not in the position to mm -hmm. uh, cater for my education uh, through law school. And I got great grades, but, you know, they just couldn't at that time. So I thought, you know, but I love to be in this sector. Let me just go do one or two. I did Inspector Bidi Akun those days. Mm -hmm. Remember, I did two episodes of Inspector Bidi Akun. How was that experience like? It was cool. You know, I, first, getting the role wasn't easy, you know, mm -hmm. when you are auditioning. And that's where I must say, then I met my industry father, Mr. Abekwe, mm -hmm. um, who was incredible, um, told me, young lady, be patient. Your time will come. I'll get up, go sit at, uh, you know, GFIC. One of the, the pain I have is the fact that GFIC was sold. Um, and we lost so much. I won't even get into that or else I'll even cry. Um, but that's where I got my break because that was like a meeting point of industry. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, it, I remember the first time sitting down and watching myself on TV. <laughs> and all I could see were the mistakes. I was oh, like, no. oh, <laughs> you know, you know. Um, you are overdoing it, you know, you are overacting. Why are you, are you being so hard on yourself? I'm, I'm, I'm like that, you know, but as I've grown, though, I've become kinder yeah, to myself. You have to. When I was younger, I was very, very hard on myself. But now I'm like, you know, you've done your best. You continue to do your best. Why not actually I cry? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But speaking of waiting for your time and being patient right. in, in this generation of social media, everybody's mm. trying to go viral. How does a young actress mm. stay authentic, stay true to whatever it is her purpose is without mm. feeling the pressure of, let me also do this so I can mm. get attention and go viral? Mm. It's tough, I must say. In my time... Um, internet wasn't so, you know, um, I've learned, I've adapted, but it wasn't so out there. But the advice I give to my, my children is really to reach internally, um, to take time to reach internally. It's hard when, when 
people are telling you when you are looking at things online and most of what you see online isn't real anyway. It's really, really tough. And looking at myself when I started, a lot of people that took the shortcut, and when I say shortcut, I mean people who uh, do things they shouldn't do or people who maybe took adv people took advantage of them, but then they thought they were whatever. And, and they got roles before I did. Um, and along the journey, people rose very fast, and I was kind of going, pacing myself, and they would become stars and boil over, and then, but they're all gone, and they all were just there temporarily. So if you're a young actress, I'll say, first of all, train. You know, be sure this is what you want to do. That's the first thing, and that you want to go the long haul. As soon as I did my first production, um, and then I was lucky I got into a good one. I knew this was what I wanted to do. So when I decided this was what I wanted to do, even though I'd finished university, Cape Coast University, I went back to school, to NAFTI, mm. and started first year again. So I have two degrees. I finished Cape Coast University, went back to NAFTI, started first year again, liberals and Afro stars and everything again, wow. and did another four years to become a director. But when you train, nobody can take it away from you. Yeah. So you need to train. You need to spend time on that. And then you need to project. Do I want to be in this for 10 years, for five years, for two years? If you're, uh, I call myself a long distance runner. If you're a long distance runner, then pace yourself and know that if people are making the news today, it doesn't mean that you will not make the news tomorrow. Take your time, train, and it will all come to you when the time is right. At what point did you know for a fact mm -hmm. that this is the path I want to be on and I'm committed to this for life? Ha! Huh. I think um, when I, first of all, before I went to the University of Cape Coast, I was lucky. Um, I was in Deadly Voyage. I loved the experience. I was like, this is great. I want to continue. I got, you know, uh, invited to follow them, my friends those days, Omar Epps and stuff. Come come to the U.S. I'm like, and then I read. So I was like, if I come to the U.S., I'm just going to wait tables. And I hadn't gone to the university. So I thought, first, let me go to the university so that I will have, you know, I can do this as a business yeah. um, in my mind. Because as soon as I, I started to do it, I was like, this thing, if you don't control the business side of it, you won't yeah. last. Mm -hmm. So I educated myself. So I went back to school. And then when I came out, um, and then I wanted to go do my master's. So then I, you know, I was discussing, I was like, do I go to do my master's? Do I go do communication or whatever? And I'm like, you know, but even, and then I went to NAFTI, I went to find out. And they were like, no, if you want to come back here, uh, you have to come and start from first year again, because we can't give you credit to start second year. You have to start like you are a fresh, wow. fresher. And it was a hard choice because yeah. I just finished university. I didn't do very well in Cape Coast, I must say, because I was working whilst I was, I was, I was in, uh, school. in school uh, and traveling from Accra to Cape Coast for wow. lectures. It was quite uh, the experience. But then I thought, you know, but four years is going to come. And after four years, will I be what I want to be or would I be something else? And whether I go back, and start first year or not, four years will come anyway. So I thought, let me go back. Um, and then I was sure. I mean, you can't make such a commitment and not be sure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my, my baby then was barely six months. Wow. Uh, I was still breastfeeding. And I thought, I'm going back to school. I'm going back to first year. And this is it for me. I'm, you know, I'm going back. Instead of going to get my master's, I'm going back to get another degree. Um, I better be sure of this, of this trajectory. And uh, there's, there hasn't been any looking back. Even when I went finally to do my master's and did public service and uh, public administration and all that, it was still in my mind of how do I come back to transform my sector? How do I get into the public service and make real change? Because you can be in the private sector and talk and talk and talk. But if you're not at the, at the space where you can actually do something that can become policy, then it, you are not going very far. So speaking so, of do something, we're not going to transition from your experience in the private sector and when you decided that you're going to give back and, right. and really transform the sector. When you joined uh, the Ghana movie space mm -hmm. some decades ago, what was it like? And what were some of the loopholes you began to see as you, you, know, you really became who you are within it? And then what drove you to say, 
I really want to be part of the change makers. Before you answer that, I mm. want our viewers to send all their questions uh, to us. The WhatsApp line is 0550585832. You can also use the hashtag Breakfast Daily to join us. We're talking to Juliet Ya Asantoa Asante. She's a CEO of the National Films Authority. She's also the board chair of NAFTI and the founder of the Black Star International Film Festival. She's an entrepreneur. She's also a philanthropist. She does a lot of things. And we really want you to get the most out of her experience so that you'll be inspired to start your own journey. So, Juliet, <laughs> how was it like? You know, the gaps that I faced kind of informed the decisions I right. took, you know. First of all, people were not lasting. <laughs> the pay was terrible. People would take advantage of you. No real change was happening. The quality was poor. Um, production values were low. Um, and as a young woman, you know, um, you know, people would take advantage of you uh, or try to take advantage of you. And I was seeing so many people grow and dedicate their, their time because, you know, being a creative is so tasking. Um, they say God created us in, in his own image. And I think the creative are the closest to God because, <laughs> you know, you're always creating. And yeah. to create, you have to connect with your God, the God in you, the God without, and um, be able to speak you, uh, to create from you, from nothing. So it's very tough when you are doing that and you are also struggling with everyday life. <laughs> you know, <laughs> how am I feeding my, my family yeah. um, and, and all that and living in, in, you know, to be inspired, you need to be in an inspiring environment. environment. And how do you create beautiful things when you've never seen beautiful things? Um, so it, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting situation we are in because... In Ghana, as in most African countries, we are so focused on our basic needs that we are stuck there. We forget that to get out of the basic needs, you have to put people in a space where they can imagine something beyond themselves and where they are. And I think that's one of the biggest gaps. So these were the things that jumped at me. And then obviously I was lucky enough to have my Liberian background. Mm -hmm. um, and, and before the war, it was a beautiful country. You are allowed to be yourself at school. You can talk and grow your hair and, and be, be whatever you, really. you be you. <laughs> and, and so I thought, you know, there are two spaces I'm interested in. Um, the, the, the creative space, film, and education. Um, and, and these two are so connected. You know, even if you're a doctor, you can only be a better doctor if you're creative. If you're a carpenter. Anything that you want to do, you can be better if you are creative, more creative at it. Even an accountant, you know, you can be a better creative accountant. So those are the gaps that I saw that told me, you know, there's some point and I had to make the decision because obviously, even when I got this position, I was just about to make my next movie. I'd written the script. I even made an announcement on social media. Wow when I was called for the position. But one thing had always been clear for me, that if the collective doesn't move forward, I am not going anywhere. You know, I would go to uh, festivals and travel around the world and, and I'll be the only person there. How does that help me? I'm not going anywhere. For a society to move forward, you have to move together as a team. So if I'm there and I say, this is my fellow Ghanaian, this is my fellow Ghanaian, this is my fellow African, this is my fellow filmmaker, this is my fellow woman. Then, you know, we have gravitas. I like using that word. And so I realized that, you know, I could do whatever I wanted to do, but if I didn't step back and try and, you know, bring the little I had learned in my journey, because I've been very lucky, let me say that, I've been a very blessed person from I've managed to come out of every difficulty. I've, I've had the most incredible experiences. You know, I've slept on the streets before in New York. I've, you know, people think I went to, wow. you go there and everything is rosy. How did you end up sleeping on the streets? Oh, that's a whole different, you know, oh, I don't want to take you there. I don't know no, if you have important. enough time. But just briefly. I remember. everybody thinks it's all green. It's and not just all green. And... and you know what was interesting? I slept on the streets when I had my Harvard certificate in my hands. Wow. And I don't know if you remember some time ago, Hurricane Sandy, Sandy yeah. uh, happened and I'd finished school and I didn't know. I, I like to then. call it, yeah, I like to recent. call it on my water. 2012, 2013, 2013 yeah. 
Queens. I, I volunteered yeah, in Queens yeah, to help yeah. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, you know, I just finished school. You know, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have any money. Um, so I used my last money to put my daughter. I was like, you have a choice, you know. You can go back home or you can stay here. You can try and make a difference or you can. So, you know, at that time I was trying to figure out what I do, um, whether I, you know. And so I put my daughter in school. I decided I was going to come back and see what I could do. And I had no money. And my rent had just ended and I just put all my stuff in, 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 in storage. And hurricane happened and I was caught in the middle and I didn't have a ticket you know, and I walked, I remember walking from Yonkers to Manhattan You're kidding. in the night with my suitcase behind me and crying, oh Lord, why did you bring me to Harvard if you knew I was going to sleep on the streets? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I went through that a couple of days. Uh, I would enter into hotels, hotel lobby and pretend like I was a guest and sit there a little bit um, and then move to the next space so they don't recognize me. So I did that for quite a while. Um, and then some friends put together, helped me with money. I bought my ticket. But luckily, my daughter was in school, so I didn't have to worry about that. And I bought my ticket. I had my business plan. My business had collapsed because I was away. And you know how when you leave your things Everybody to workers, does, yeah. they, they kind of turn my business into their business. Um, so I came back and I started afresh. Juliet. Talk to us about putting all these crazy, fun challenges, experiences together and then paying it forward. You went to NAFTI, now you're the board chair. Right. Started Black Star International Film Festival, now you're the CEO of the National Film Authority. Mm -hmm. How important is it to see every single thing you go through as a lesson that's preparing you for something greater? It's critical. Sometimes we get stuck in the challenges we go through. Um, and I certainly have had my share of challenges. I think I've started my life all over again, like four to five times, you know, ground zero, to the point where I say, you know, if a goat is, there's a, there's a proverb that if a goat is on the ground about to cut the head, it's no longer a, 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 afraid of death because yeah. it's already down. Yeah. But there's another saying that you use the stones that, you know, the universe or people throw at you and use it as a building block. Even since I got into the position, you know, it's been one stone after the other, but there are lessons in there. There are opportunities in there. There, you know, and if you just treat everything from a point of love, I never carry negativity. I see everything as a building block. And Every single experience I've had has contributed to my now. I wouldn't be Juliet Yasanto Asante if I hadn't been sick, if I had my family hadn't gone through war, if I hadn't had a if I hadn't had terrible relationships, if I hadn't had my own struggles, if I hadn't slept on the street before, if I hadn't gone hungry before. Um, if I hadn't stayed in the house where there was no um, easing yourself facilities and all that. And all of these things have come together to bring me to a beautiful place where I see that everything is possible. I love it. Now, our viewers have been asking questions. So I have to ask. Uh, good morning, Jifa. Please, can you ask Ma Julie? I don't know if you want us to call Ma. <laughs> Ma Julie. Oh, be friend, Mr. Ayaba. Why do Ma Julie, dear. <laughs> Why we don't get access to any of the Ghanaian movies after their premiere, mm. like Aloe Vera, Away Bus, Kijitia, etc.? Well, we all know, unfortunately, um, Aloe Vera, for instance, was still doing the cinematic run when COVID struck, um, mm. which was sad because at that time the sector was just about picking up again. We're hoping that we can go back, you know, and, and start things from where it, it ended. But one of the biggest gaps we have in the sector is distribution. Yeah. Um, and distribution is, is, I can't say it enough. I can say it enough. And that also stems away from the fact that, you know, we don't focus a lot on the business of film. So I must say that one of my pride, actually, as the chair of NAFTI is the fact that we are introducing two new courses. Nice. Uh, one in script writing, which is like uh, the backbone. If you don't have a good story, you don't have a good story. You can use all the sophisticated equipment and you do not have a good story. So script is such an important aspect. And then the business of film. Um, you know, 
there are people, filmmakers, who that is their business. So if you're a filmmaker, you know, you can decide you want to be a writer in the, you know, you want to be any, any, at any point down the value chain. And being in the business side of things where you pretty much just distribute and get products, content from point A to point B is critical. Mm -hmm. And so for me, introducing the business of film as a course at NAFTI has taken too long. And I'm happy that it will be happening uh, or, you know, we started it. We are just about getting the credit accreditation and moving forward with it. So hopefully, you know, NAFTI will do its part. The NFA will do its part. We will close the distribution gap and it will be easier for people to get access to content. Great. There's another question here about how you combine your public duties with your business. This is coming from Tampuri Abubakari. Ah, <laughs> well, unfortunately, my business... All my businesses have, I don't want to say collapse or <laughs> whatever, because, you know, the thing is... They've served their purpose. Uh, well, not that they've served their purpose, but I'm so focused on what I'm doing. I'm so focused on the NFA um, that nothing else, nothing else, you know, the NFA and NFT... Speaking of NFA, we've uh, been doing some great, really great stuff, presidential right, pitches. Right. What else can we expect from... A um, lot. Um, I think, I don't want to preempt, but, you know, but I, <laughs> but, you know, City, you, you are my... My first every time so you know you can trust that the announcement will come but you know when I started I talked about the diversity of the sector yeah. so for us when we are thinking we think about okay this will satisfy this part this will also work on this part this will also work on this part this so you know we have something for every you know even when you come into the sector you have those who feel like they are high up and doing the glamour films, and then you have those who are doing the local films, and they're all so important if we need to move forward. So we have plans for every segment uh, of our stakeholders. We think about our stakeholders, and, and so you can trust that a lot more will come. Juliet, thank you so much for being with thank us. Thank you Where for you having me. on social media? So it's Juliet Yasantua Asante, I think, on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I think it's Ya Asantua Asante on, on uh, Facebook. Facebook. But if you put Juliet Asante, it will still I have two Facebook. So, <laughs> you know, Juliet Asante, you find the picture, follow one, you, you know. Uh, or Ya Asantua Asante, you find me easily. I think on Twitter is also Juliet Asante. On uh, LinkedIn is Juliet Ya Asantua Asante. Just Google her. Just Google <laughs> Ya Asantua <laughs> or Juliet or, you know. A lot of people are getting used to my Ya Asantua. Yeah. Um, Anybody who knows me from way back calls me, yeah, Aww. not Julie, yeah, <laughs> you know, so it's a pity that um, I felt like I've, I've arrived at owning my name yeah. late and, I've, and if I had the choice again, I would own my Ghanaian name and everything which is Ghanaian about me. And so I encourage everybody to stick to their local names and please don't cut your girl's hair. Thank you so much, Juliet, for being with us. I, I mean, you are the true embodiment of paying it forward. You know, Thank you've been you. in the industry, you've, you've done so well, you've succeeded, you could have decided that, listen, I'm going to live my best life and be on a beach. I am living my best <laughs> life, actually. But you're still doing what I love. Lives you know, while I would, you're at I would it, you know, do so. this for free. Exactly. I've done it for free. I'll continue to do it for free. And that's the one thing. When you find what you love, and oh I love God. this, yeah. you know, I sleep it, I eat it, I drink it. When you find what you love and you focus your life on that, then you would find the strength to move forward no matter what. And I think for me, that's what has been the difference. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you at home for staying. We hope that you've been inspired by this conversation. The most important thing is that you get to decide your life, right? And you don't get to compromise on anything. And if you keep going, if it's the path you've chosen, you're going to succeed. And when you get there, try your best to pay it forward.